Hello and welcome to another segment of Western Wisconsin Journal. I'm Jamie Johnson, the legal and government correspondent, and it is uh, election season. Today happens to be the primary in Wisconsin, and my guest today is Assembly candidate Barry Hammerbeck. Barry, welcome to the show. Good afternoon. Thank you. So, um, uh, Barry is running for the 30th Assembly District, and uh, that district has changed. About every census, the district gets a little smaller because we're growing in population, so it's smaller geographic wise. But uh, uh, so, why don't you start with uh, telling us who you are and why you're running, and um, before you get into the qualification part, just remind folks, the 30th Assembly District comprised of what areas? Okay, I'll take a swing at it. The 30th Assembly District is comprised of, in Pierce County, River Falls Township, uh, and then the city of River Falls is included in that. Hudson would be included in that, North Hudson, uh, and up to St. Uh, Joseph uh, Township, and then across over to Roberts and back on down. Okay. So that has uh, changed a little bit. I think when I ran over 20 years ago, the, the 30th Assembly District was not even over to Roberts, but it was the whole thing of Pierce County. So that has now shifted to another district, I guess. Yes, they seem to change all, of, all the time, but, but it's a good solid district. And uh, you know we've got some very co fairly cohesive values, I believe, in the district. And so I'm, I want to- A lot less that. rural than it was a couple decades ago, too. Yes, we were looking at many, many farms, you know, 40 to 80 cows in a farm, uh, farming a lot more important then, and we've become a lot more urban in the last 20 years, especially here in western Wisconsin. I-94 coming across brings people across back and forth, and uh, it's just a natural place to grow, and we have. All right, speaking of farming, because I want to get into your qualifications, and I know a little bit about we happen to have the same professional uh, profession anyway, being lawyers, but tell the folks a little bit about yourself and what you've done. All right, well, I have a law practice uh, in the city of River Falls. I've been there oh, almost 40 years, I guess. Been a trial lawyer, and I've worked mostly with dairy farms. I grew up on a dairy farm uh, in northwestern Minnesota, uh, and so I'm very familiar with, with farming. Uh, and then uh, I've also uh, been around the country when I was younger. My, my folks decided to, to move around a bit, so I ended up in Alaska for a few years and uh, Oregon, where I graduated from college initially, and then I came back to Minnesota to go to law school uh, after a short uh, stretch working for Mobile Oil in Australia. Uh, okay. So I came back, I went to law school here, uh, went to work for Les Gaylord in River Falls, and oh, okay. loved it, and never left. Okay. So yeah, that is uh, going back a ways, and uh, uh, Les was a great guy. Well, um, so as far as family? Uh, well, I've got my wife, Pat. Uh, she has a shop in River Falls, Custom Framing and Art. She's been there almost as long as I have. Uh, I have uh, three children, Arity, uh, my oldest daughter. She's an adjunct professor at the University of Wisconsin in River Falls. Uh, my uh, middle daughter, Kate, uh, is out in Oregon. Uh, she uh, works for nonprofits out there uh, managing those. And then my youngest son, Sam, uh, lives in River Falls but does uh, technical work for a company in New York. So you raised your children in River Falls. Right then. in River Falls, went to River Falls schools, University of Wisconsin, River Falls, and the University of Wisconsin. Okay. So you got some deep roots here. And uh, being, I'll have to ask your age, um, the, being a uh, person who's got a long career already, you know, why somebody would want to get into running, but what is your age? Uh, I'll be 67 this November. Okay. And so why do you feel like this is a good time to be running for the State Assembly? Well, I don't know as it is a good time uh, to be running for the State Assembly, but I think it's the time uh, to be running. Uh, I, was, I was never planning to run for the State Assembly. I was quite happy with the way things were. Uh, and then I became really dissatisfied when this Foxconn deal came out and uh, to the point where I decided I should try to do something about this. That's oh. how I got into it. Okay. Well, we'll probably talk a little bit more about Foxconn, but what is it that from that deal that you, that primarily motivated you then to run for assembly? I didn't see anybody else that was doing it. I'm slowly getting retired from the law practice. As you know, you can't just stop a law practice. You have to wind it up a bit and it takes some time to get that done. Uh, and so I was looking like I would have time to do that. Uh, and I thought, well, uh, you know, I'm certainly qualified. I've negotiated things. I've written laws. I've uh, 
worked in every concept of law. I also ran a business uh, here, a uh, business called L MRLB International. Uh, it was a Minnesota company, but we did manufacturing, and I was the CEO of that for about 10 years. Uh, so I know business, and I know manufacturing. I knew what it would take to get a startup company because that's what we were. And I thought, I don't know if one person can actually make a difference, but I think I'm willing to try. Okay. Very, very good. Um, s speaking about the Foxconn deal. Yes. What is it specifically that, um, I guess, motivated you to, to, to run? Four and a half billion dollars of taxes or tax credit, is, it's money out of the state's pocket, any way you look at it. On a single entity or single venture, I think, is not a good idea at any rate. I think it should be spread out. Our problem in Wisconsin is the lack of startups, not the lack of really employment. I mean, we knew, need new and creative businesses, and our, our unemployment rate is down, so the timing for that is not very good. And then talking about making flat screen TVs or flat panel devices like that, we all know that as fast as technology moves, that's a very short-term proposition. You can't see much coming out of that. And the thought occurred to me, what if we put four and a half billion dollars into the University of Wisconsin system? Uh, I mean, it's, that's about a two and a half billion dollar operation. The state right now puts in about 500 uh, million, I guess, uh, into it to make the On thing an right. annual basis? On an annual basis. What if we put that money into the University of Wisconsin? Think of the jobs that would be generated from that. Uh, think of the, if we're just Assembly District 30, uh, think of the status that we would get. I mean, we'd be a much better place to have businesses and employees. Uh, we could attract better health care, for example. We really need some mental health care uh, facilities here in western Wisconsin to help deal with the opioid uh, crisis and many other things. So why, what if we didn't, what if we'd have just spent that money on that? And it really is as simple as getting back to the Wisconsin idea that's a hundred years old. That's what made Wisconsin what it is today. A good solid educational access to, to everybody. And so that's why I decided somebody's got to try to do something about this. To me, that's the biggest issue because it helps solve many of the other issues that we're facing. So you'd like to see a little more state resources spent here in western Wisconsin? Then. Yes. I was also shocked. Uh, my, my opponent uh, liked the deal. Uh, he actually didn't vote on it, but he was in favor of it. He was in Amsterdam when the vote came down. Uh, but he appeared next day and said, I would have voted for it, and he said uh, he, said he has. Uh, and uh, in, in backing that, oh, I forgot where I was going to where I was going to go with that. Actually. We're talking about spending resources here in western Wisconsin. Yeah, and so I thought it was actually politics as usual. All right, maybe, maybe you know, we did something for Kenosha, or, or, and we're going to get something back. Maybe we're going to get a facility. Maybe we're going to get funding. Maybe we're going to get something special, because that's how I see politics from the outside. Uh, if you're going to negotiate something, what do you get? You know, okay, I'll vote for that. We got nothing. Mm -hmm. We got zero. In fact, I calculated that it was about $60 million of our tax money from Pearson St. Croix County that was helping facilitate this Foxconn deal. And we're sitting here with infrastructure. And over how many years is that projected, that, that investment's being? The Foxconn, well, the payback is 45 years. For them to pay it back. Yeah, for, for them to pay it back. In the meantime, what do we do about our roads and our schools? And, uh, you know, do we wait right. until the end of 45 but years? That's coming out of, like, uh, is that paid to them? I, I mean, is that coming straight out of a budget it, somewhere? It, it, uh, no, it's, it's a package, as I understand it. Uh, and it's hard to find out all of the details of this, actually. But as I understand it, it's a bunch of tax credits, uh, various preferences here and there that go on uh, that are raised uh, in incentives, uh, if you will, and they're all designed to come in and, and uh, end up being four and a half billion dollars. Uh, it started out at three billion and then it got built back up and now I understand, oh, maybe it's coming back down. That's part of my problem with it. There's not much transparency there. I mean, okay. where, where does the money go? It doesn't go into Pearson St. Croix County. Okay, so that's a motivator for you to run and you yes. kind of inkle it about, you would look at things through a lens of trying to get uh, a benefit to Western Wisconsin on, right. on different things. But on a statewide scale, what do you see as the issues that um, maybe the government hasn't been looking at for the last six, eight years? Um, 
one of the things we need to look at is to fund the programs that are there. We need to invest in Wisconsin. We can't just cut, cut, cut until there's nothing there. If we do that, I mean, what are we living here for? People live in Wisconsin because they, they love it. Uh, they like the hills and the streams and the beautiful natural resources that we have. And it costs money to maintain those. It costs an investment. And the people that live here, I believe, are not afraid to invest in the things that they love. Now, the opposition would say, well, by cutting the taxes and the government not spending the money on those things, it allows private entities to then spend the resources where they wish. And what do you say in response to that? They'll just take the money and leave. I was in business. Businesses are not there for moral purposes. They are amoral. They're just there to make money. It's government's job to set a level playing field for those those businesses to work in so they all have to compete the same. We don't want businesses to come in and just take what we've got and then leave. We want businesses that are good neighbors, that like our schools, that like our environment, that help us out, that are willing to pay what it takes to make Wisconsin great. Speaking of schools, um, what is your take on how education has been treated for the last eight years and in this last biennium where they passed a budget that greatly increased the amount of spending in, in our public schools and our private schools through the voucher system. Well, thank heavens. Yeah. Thank heavens they, they managed right before the election to, uh, you know, to get some funding in here. But it doesn't really upset uh, or offset, in my view, the $100 million they took out of the University of Wisconsin to build a stadium. Okay. That I'm still angry about that. I mean, it's this lack of vision that the current regime has, has shown uh, toward the future of Wisconsin. We should be looking out a hundred years, a hundred years, not four or six, and mm -hmm. saying, where will we be? Where will our children be? Where will our grandchildren be? And I simply don't see that. So what about, like you talked about investments in environment, how about our infrastructure and the direction that our roads, um, we've seen surveys coming out and judging where Wisconsin falls on its roads. Uh, when I was, Younger, when I was in school, actually, I remember Wisconsin was always towards the top as far as, you know, keeping our infrastructure and road spending and so forth. But yeah, what's happened there? Well, they haven't spent the money on the roads. They've said, well, we'll cut taxes because we can. It costs money to have good roads, and you can't cut taxes and have good roads if that's your mission. I mean, the simplest thing to do would be to let the, the fuel tax float up to the seven cents or so that it, it would have, you know, if it had been adjusted for inflation. But we've got to get over this idea of, of cut, cut, cut. We've got to say, here's a program that we love and believe in and will help us in the future, and then we have to invest in it. Okay, so investing, uh, you mentioned education, environment, infrastructure, what other areas? We certainly have some long-term problems with mental health, mental health issues, and I drag several things into that group. Uh, mental health itself. Here in western Wisconsin, if they have an involuntary commitment, a Chapter 51 commitment is what it's called, right now there's no facility here uh, that they can use. So if a person that's having difficulties goes into a hospital and said, I've been thinking uh, about doing myself in or something like that, well, they'll get, uh, they'll have to stay, they'll call the police department, and guess what? They'll end up in handcuffs in the back of a police car going to Oshkosh. In Winnebago County? Uh. Yeah, that's the, that's the closest facility. Now, uh, Pierce County and St. Croix County have talked to both boards, and, and what, what they're talking about doing is, is trying to get more private local facilities that they can place it, but they're not doing uh, very well at it. They're not having a very good response. Well, and it doesn't, but, I mean, because you're starting to cross when you're talking about mental health. That's not very far away from our criminal justice system either. No, and that's my next step, because we have one of the highest incarceration rates uh, of any of the states uh, right here in Wisconsin. We're over a billion dollars in budget uh, for prisons. Why do we have so many people in prison? Are there that many bad people in here? We have twice as many uh, people of color in prison as Minnesota with about the same demographic. You know. What, what's wrong? There's something fundamentally wrong. And we're not spending the time or the money to go find out what it is. We're kind of just running around. So what we need to do is take a look at, at, at the spending for prisons, take a look at our mental health situation, and, and take a good look at ourselves and say, 
what can we do to, to improve this? I mean, the rate of suicides in western Wisconsin is a big issue. I know Patty Schaffner talks mm. about that all right. the time, and she's right. I mean, that's a critical issue. Why, why this trouble? Uh, and we need to try to so understand it. So would, you would invest more in the mental health and kind of that old adage, an uh, ounce of prevention and a pound uh, is worth a pound of cure. Mm -hmm. Maybe we could end up cutting our prison uh, budget if we started doing more on the front end. Is that your? That's my take. That's, that's my belief is that we can. In fact, that's what the research, research mostly shows. And surprisingly, of course, education is a prime a prime leader in reduction of incarceration rates. The, the more educated a population is, the lower the incarceration rates. So my idea of, of funding uh, the University of Wisconsin and our local schools more strongly, I think, would lead to lower rates of incarceration and lower costs in the long run. Uh, chemical addiction and mental health issues, uh, in addition to impacting greatly on criminal justice, also um, is a factor with our health care system. Yes. And so uh, what is your take and what would be your issue stance on that issue of, on health care? We should have badger care for everybody. We should have one program, a single prayer program, and Wisconsin is known for starting things. We should just do it ourselves. If the federal government won't do it, we should do similar it. Similar to what um, the Republican governor in Massachusetts did. Um, very similar. Yeah, okay. Yeah, very similar. Uh, now, People say, well, where are you going to get the money for that? Um, do, uh, well, where, do you think it starts maybe with um, the federal partnership and maybe doing block grants so that the, the states can then do um, their own systems then? Well, well I think it could. Uh, but when people talk about how are you going to pay for it or, or what are you going to do, I think right now of, of what I pay for my wife's health insurance, uh, which I got through the exchange system, it's I think $1,100 or better a month uh, for just her. I'm on Medicare uh, now after I turned 65. And if you think of, okay, am I going to pay 1000 a month in taxes to support a program like everyone does like that? Well, no, I'm not. If everyone was in that health care program, the cost right now is just being hidden in a different way. Everybody's paying this money. So it's not like we have to pay it twice, right? Right. And so when people say, oh, we, you know, we have to drag out that money, well, maybe we don't. We need to think about that a little more carefully and say, what, what's the offset that we're paying now? And what are the savings that we can make in working with some of these medical institutions uh, by, by all working together? Yeah, I think that our firm pays something like, the firm share is like 20000 a year, and then my share is another uh, eight or 9000 on top four family um, family coverage that it's being paid it's just we're not it's not a tax but it's being paid into a system where um, there's supposedly competition and it's keeping the cost down do you see much competition right now in our no. health care system no there's there's no competition uh, no real competition if you go on the exchange I think there was only one choice I could make and that was with Medica uh, insurance in Pierce County where I live uh, so there's no competition I mean it's one thing to say we've got these choices and yeah competition will be down and then give an insurance company a monopoly uh, and you don't have any competition. So you don't have a choice. So we need to do something about that. And, and the only way that I know that I think would be fair would be to do a single payer-like system. And frankly, I've talked to a lot of doctors, physicians, and surgeons that would like that too. They're really tired of the circles that they have to run around in to get funding, and to get jobs, to work for all these. Would that have an impact maybe on the pricing side? Because right now, you go for a colonoscopy, you could call four different facilities, and your range could be threefold as far as what the cost would be. Yes. Do, you, do you think we'd see more uniformity with the? Well, yes, especially if you mandated what the cost would be. I mean, that's what Medicare does. Say, okay, we'll pay X for a colonoscopy, that's what you get paid. Uh, and a lot of the other developing countries or developed countries that, that have health care systems like that do that. They just say, okay, here's, here's what you'll get paid for that. So everybody knows what they'll get paid. If you go to the hospital, you know what you need to pay. There's no guessing. I was going to say, if, if shopping for colonoscopy, I, I laughed because I did that a few years ago. Very hard to find out if you ask 
ask them, hey, what's it going to cost? They'll say, well, I don't really know. You know, are you in a program here? Are you on this program there and this? And it turns out that a single hospital might have quite a range of payments. And I think we need to put an end to that. If you're going to have that range of payments, then they're going to have to advertise their prices so people can actually right. shop. Right, and I thought I heard that there was legislation, whether it was on the state or the federal level somewhere, that where they wanted to say you have to publish your prices for your procedures, but I, I, apparently there's a lobby that might be fighting that. Well, yeah, I'd say that's probably true. Uh, that gets back to the business side. Okay, the business side, there's nothing I'd like better than to not have to tell what the prices are and to get what I thought I could demand out of it. And that's government's job, as I see it these days, to now get in and say, nope, level the playing field. We're not going to be arguing about this. You can argue about service, you can argue about other things, but you can't pay fast and loose with people's lives or their money. You can't be saying it's your money or your life. Life. That's that's just wrong. Okay, so we've touched on the, the health care and education. Um, what are some of the? Do you see the issues in your assembly race being parallel with uh, maybe the gubernatorial race? In some ways, uh, in, in some ways, I think I think it is. You know, on the state level, the, the same issues are there, and you have to be interested in the gubernatorial race because uh, whatever is going to happen there is going to affect. You know, what can be done about the school funding and so forth? We we know what the last eight years have done to funding for the University of Wisconsin. I mean, there are tenured professors there that are leaving for untenured positions because they get paid more in Minnesota. Okay, uh, and so we need to we need to start dealing with that. What about um, any issues unique to our district? I, I'm thinking of one, tax reciprocity. Uh, this should not be a partisan issue, but yet it doesn't seem like something that can get done because when we have a Republican governor, Minnesota has a Democratic governor, and when we had a Democratic governor, Minnesota had a Republican governor. But should, um, where do you stand on the, on the tax reciprocity issue? Well, th the numbers always, seem to favor, uh, you know, Wisconsin needs to, to get more out of that than we give. Uh, I mean, we're not getting our, our fair share out of that. So the question is, how do, you, how do you get Minnesota to do that? And do we have to set up different kinds of taxes? Uh, having come from Minnesota 40 years ago or so, you know, I, I say, yeah, it's okay to come across the river, but then I stayed and worked. But there are people that, that love it in Wisconsin like I do, and they'd much rather live here than, than Minnesota, so they work over there because they get paid more. Uh, and I can't blame them for doing that either. So we need to get our, our jobs up and, and just make it a better place over here so people can work here and get paid the same. So, uh, you know, the slogan has been Wisconsin's open for business. And you being a former businessman, you know, running, start business and so forth, um, are you not in agreement with that kind of concept? It's BS. Okay. Uh, there's, there's simply, we are not open for business. We are number 50 in business startups in the state of Wisconsin, dead last, absolutely on the bottom. So we might be. Well, that's why we need to do the Foxconn deal. Bring us up a little bit. <laughs> Let me talk about the Foxconn deal. So, so my opponent, uh, Mr. Zimmerman, actually took advantage of a tax break that he got when he moved his company Sagen to River Falls. He had, I think, he told me fifty thousand dollars to do that. He promised thirty-six jobs uh, if he got fifty thousand dollars to do this, and he outperformed that. He did 130 jobs. He was just exactly the kind of business that we'd want in River Falls. He used the university tied in with everything we've got. Uh, 130 people have jobs. They're good paying jobs. He did a fine job. There, how many times does 50,000 go into four and a half billion? Well, the answer is 90,000. So we could have given 90,000 startup jobs 50,000 90,000 startup businesses. Yes. At 36 to 40 jobs per. A, a per, which is over 2 million jobs if you want to do that, or raise, raise the value. I mean, any way you look at Foxconn, it's just a bad business deal. Unless you're Foxconn, then it's the deal of the century. Right. But it's a bad business deal, and that doesn't even touch the environmental concerns of drawing seven, eight million dollars of water out of the out of the lake a day. You know some of the toxic waste issues that are there, our environment that that we all in Wisconsin love, and so that's why the Foxconn deal was just so bad. 
And uh, I, I don't know anybody that can really look at this and say it's, it's good for business. What about the businesses in, in Wisconsin uh, that have been here for years? Harley-Davidson, uh, A.O. Smith Corporation, some of the big ones that have been here. Some of the insurance companies that have been here forever. Uh, what about, well, what about part of it was that they're going to say, well, uh, they're going to build in flexibility because you talked about the technology changing and the fact that TV screens have changed a little bit over the last 40 years. Yeah. And so 40 years from now, are we going to be using flat screens? Maybe they'll build in flexibility to the building to be able to manufacture something else other than flat well, screens. Well, well, I hope they do. Okay. I hope they do. But do, do we really want just one business? Wouldn't it have been much better to have 90,000? other startup businesses? I mean, what, that's the judgment call. Right. Uh, spread it out over the state instead of all down in the southeast corner. Yeah, ex exactly. I mean, they're especially, you know, up in the northern tiers of Wisconsin, uh, they're having problems with, uh, with school budgets and everything else because there's not enough people, there's not enough businesses, there's not enough income. And so... Well, we and populations are shrinking. Right. Because there's no jobs for the kids to stay, so they move out of state. Exactly. So we need to put a stop to that, and the way to do it is to get startups all over and doing one big Fox So instead of one thing. big investment in one corner of the state, yeah. uh, do a similar investment but spread it out over a larger area. Exactly. So you're not necessarily anti-business, just maybe um, foreign big business and focused in one area that... Um, might be putting all the eggs in one basket. Yeah, I'm, I'm definitely pro-business. I, I like business. I did business myself. I think business plays a great part in, in our society and community. But business should be an equal partner with us uh, that live here. I don't see as they need to be preferred or, or under or over. They just need to be treated fairly uh, and pay a fair price for it. All right. What about possibly elimination of taxes? Do we, um, we've been gradually shrinking the income tax. Uh, how about getting rid of it all together? What would be your take on that? Well, I'm just thinking that our roads would really be good then. Yeah. <laughs> and of course, I'm being facetious. The roads right. would really be terrible. Really. I mean, so we really got to cut that. What are we going to do? Put a sales tax on? That's the alternative. Uh, I've heard numbers that have to be 12% or so. Uh, you know, there are sales states sales. that have 9, 10, 11 percent state well, sales. Well, sales. there are, and, they, and uh, I just think that's a regressive form of taxation, uh, and I don't, I don't think it's a good one. Uh, okay. I guess I come down to that. I don't think there's anything wrong with the income tax uh, as long as everybody pays their fair share of it. It's a fairly flat income tax as well in Wisconsin. Yeah, it, it really is. Wisconsin's got a low tax rate. And, and the people that are arguing about, oh, the tax rate's too high, well, gosh, it might be a half a percent or in some places a percent higher. You know, if you spread all of the states across the board for income tax, there's not much difference uh, from the uh, from a percentage point in the tax rate. So that's really not the major difference. I think I think what we have to get over is the idea that you can cut and cut taxes uh, without losing quality of life. You, if you keep cutting, you're going to lose. We have to reinvest in ourselves, and really that's what taxes in good government should do. Okay. Uh, any other areas then? We've got uh, a few more minutes um, that you would like to tell voters that might distinguish you from your opponent. Well, I actually live in the district. I think that's uh, that's something that's up for grabs. Uh, there's a question about whether Mr. Zimmerman actually lives in uh, Assembly District 30 as, as opposed to uh, Well, I think he owns two residences and... Yeah. So, uh, so apparently he lives at his son's house in River Falls, but I guess that's up to him uh, to decide. So that's an issue. Uh, but perhaps a big one, perhaps not. Depends on what he wants to do with voting. Uh, I. I think one of the things I do, I, uh, I've been involved in a veteran outreach program uh, for the last couple of years. Uh, in fact, a partner and I invested in a Huey helicopter. Uh, so if you see a big number. Are you a pilot? Yeah, I'm a, I'm a pilot, a commercial helicopter pilot and uh, airline transport rated pilot. Okay. Uh, it's been my hobby for all these years. Yeah, we didn't get into hobbies, but yeah, that's a nice hobby to have. Yeah, yeah, it's, well, yeah, fishing and hunting and flying are, are mine. Uh, and so. Uh, what we did is bought this helicopter and we do veterans outreach. Uh, and we got there because we both felt bad. You know, Vietnam was my war. Uh, I didn't go uh, because they didn't uh, get to my draft number in 1972 and I was, I was grateful. My partner in the helicopter is just the opposite. He volunteered. Uh, he was a Marine and in there. But we both felt that 
the people coming home weren't treated very well. I mean, they were even spit on and they had to hide and it was embarrassing. And so these four folks that were just amazingly brave to go out there and, and do fly helicopters and get shot at for days at a time, uh, you know, didn't get treated very well. So what we thought we would do is kind of a coming home thing where they could come and, and uh, we could throw them the helicopter and they could take it and show it to their kids and their grandkids and, and tell stories that they've never uh, been able to tell before. And so rather than just talking about it, you know, I guess right. my, my difference is I try to do something about it. Okay. Um, anything else that we didn't mention that folks ought to know about you or your background that uh, might give them an insight on what kind of a representative you might be for them? Obviously, you've been an advocate. You've represented a lot of folks. Well, uh, well and, I have. And farmers and... and it, and I have to be upfront, I'm new at this. You know, I don't know if one person can make a difference these days. Uh, you, you get down, you know, with 99 other folks in the assembly and then you've got everything to go to make a difference. But I'm hoping, hoping I can. You know? Now, you're not, you're not facing a primary today, so... Uh, I might win. Yeah, you, <laughs> I think that that's um, assuming that people check, enough people check the box and there's not a big write-in campaign. I haven't heard anything like that. Yeah. But um, do you have a background in uh, politics? Do you, have you been a party leader or inside party uh, broker, if you will? Uh, no, but I was the chairman of Pierce County Republicans in 1982. Okay. Uh, and so you were a Republican when Reagan was president? I, I was. Okay. Yeah. And so uh, does this mean that um, where your philosophy has shifted over the years, over those 36 years, or is it uh, more that uh, uh, there's a lot of the party people, insiders that have gone to the extremes and leaving the middle more open? I really think that's the answer, the, the latter, that they've gone to the extremes and they've, they left the middle. I, I stole Ronald Reagan's line and said, I didn't leave the party, they left me. Mm -hmm. uh, it just, just think how, you know, Richard Nixon would, I think, have been um, mod a moderate to liberal Democrat yeah. these days. Right. I mean, he's the one that passed the EPA, 99 to nothing, when, when everybody worked together. He's the one that, that uh, Nixon signed, did that. Nixon signed on Medicaid. Right. We have Medicaid because of Richard Nixon signing it in the law. Well, and the, uh, um, you know, and some of our early senators, like Proxmire, there's an example of somebody who voted with the other party 40% of the time. Is there some things that you s could see going along with the Republicans to work some kind of partnership? You talked before about negotiating a deal. You get something for it if you're going to uh, vote for something else. Do you see something where you might be able to uh, work something out? I hope so. Um, you know, I hope, I hope they're just willing to talk and don't just stonewall everybody out because that's not the way the system should work. Everybody needs to be able to participate. Even if you're in a minority, you should be able to say something about it because minorities have good ideas too. I mean, there are no Democratic ideas and no Republican ideas. There are good ideas, and that's, the, that's what we need to do. And I think I stole that from John Kennedy a long time ago. Okay, very good. Oh, Barry Hammerbeck, a, a candidate for State Assembly in the 30th District. I want to thank you for coming on the show. Well, thank you for inviting me. And you got, what, 11, 12 weeks now to the general election. Good luck with that. And uh, we'll remind the folks to get out there, research uh, the candidates, and make sure that you vote in November.